Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. Coincidence or luck? Today's story with a similar plot. Enjoy the video! As I absentmindedly prepared for dinner in my luxurious hotel room, I reflected on how my life was going. I thought I had gotten over my ex-wife's infidelity, but I realized I still had some sort of PTSD-like condition. I was dejected when my therapist first brought it up. I mean, how is experiencing a spouse's betrayal in any way similar to what soldiers go through in combat? I wasn't just upset, I was embarrassed. My therapist eventually convinced me that everyone is different and that I had nothing to be ashamed of, at least not very much. And since I gave away a cool million dollars to programs for ex-military people with PTSD, I eased my conscience. The important thing was that I continued to go to therapy. His advice about what would be helpful if I was looking for another relationship or just having a few one-night stands went in one ear and out the other. I decided that my hand would never betray me or cause me suffering, so I decided that for intimate release, at least for the moment, this was enough for me. While I was steeping my tea, my thoughts thankfully turned from the anxiety associated with memories of my ex's cheating to something more pleasant. You have a lot ahead of you, I tried to cheer myself up. I mean, you're still young at 34, good looking if the attention from women in the office is legit, and you're rich. At least the last part was true. I was definitely rich, affording the best room in the upscale hotel I was staying at was no problem for someone of my means. Although I was born with a silver spoon in my mouth, I became successful myself and grew the company my grandfather founded 100-fold and added other successful companies to it. Then why can't I turn my business acumen into a successful relationship with a woman flashed through my head, and I began to feel bad again. Why do I get nervous around all women when I'm in society? Has cheating on my ex made me fearful? Luckily, just at that moment, the doorbell rang. Yes, my hotel room was so luxurious that it had a doorbell. This brought me out of the state of re-emerging malaise. I looked at my watch. Chris is just in time, I said to myself as I walked from my bedroom through the large ornate hallway to my door. One of the few things that brought me joy after my divorce from my cheating ex was giving money to worthwhile charities, such as the ones aimed at treating PTSD in ex-military people. My staff set up a meeting in Seattle with the outreach director for a charity called Escort to Success. This was a local charity that had actually had success in moving homeless women out of poverty and into the workforce. Unfortunately, due to my phone being out of order for some unknown reason the previous day, I did not receive an email from my staff with information about Chris and the charity. But this was not a big problem, as I could easily get everything necessary at dinner and at the charity office the next day. When I opened the door, I was surprised to see a striking woman standing there. I had assumed that Chris was a man, not Christina. She appeared to be about 30 years old, probably 5 feet 8 inches tall, clearly over 6 feet tall in her heels, and was stylishly dressed with a very nice figure, including large breasts. Hello, are you Brad? She asked in a soft voice. Brett, I corrected her with a smile. Brett Connor, I continued, shaking her hand. She seemed a little taken aback by my offer of a hand to shake but accepted it. She had a strong but soft grip. I believe you are from escort to success? I smiled. Although she was a little taken aback, she answered, yes. Come in, I said, opening the door all the way and moving out of the way. Chris seemed impressed by how richly furnished my room was. She made a number of pleasant comments, some of them indicating that she understood art and maybe even loved it. I brought her a drink, she wanted a vodka martini while we talked about the environment. I even asked her if she wanted to take a little tour and check out the view from the bedroom, which had a truly breathtaking view of the city. She nodded accordingly, and standing in the bedroom, began to remove her shawl made of cashmere fabric. Don't take off your pashmina, I smiled. We will discuss business in the restaurant, not here. Let's finish our drinks and go. I saw a puzzled expression on her face, but she accepted the program. We finished our drinks in the waiting room, then walked out, got into the elevator, and went down to the lobby. I hope you don't mind a farm-to-table restaurant, I said as we drove down. I'm tired of both steakhouses and new cuisine. Whatever, she replied as we walked toward the front door together. She almost seemed to expect me to take her hand, which surprised me a little. 
In Chicago, business partners usually have no skin-to-skin -skin contact, I thought to myself. Maybe things are different in Seattle. As we approached the front door, I asked the doorman if our limousine had arrived. He smiled and waved his hand toward a limousine parked a few cars away in the driveway. As it pulled up, he opened the door for Chris and me, and I handed him a $20 bill, for which he thanked me profusely. After my divorce, I began to tip very generously. As we drove to the restaurant, Chris and I talked about the weather, Seattle politics, local sports teams, and just about everything. Chris seemed very impressed with the limo and even accepted the offer of a drink from the small bar in the car. When we arrived at the restaurant, the driver opened the door for us. His eyes seemed to widen when he saw Chris's slender legs stepping out of the car. I asked him to pick us up in two hours, to which he bowed his cap as I asked. We got the best table in the room, which made me smile as I gave the head waiter $50, which Chris noticed and made her eyes widen. After we chatted about general things, including art, which Chris seemed particularly knowledgeable about given her current comments about the paintings in the restaurant and her previous comments. About the paintings in my hotel room, we ordered appetizers and wine. When they brought snacks, we ordered dinner. The dish I chose turned out to be the most expensive on the menu. I had no intention of ordering it, I just thought it was the most pleasant. When Chris asked what I would have and I told her, she asked if she could order the same, and I replied, certainly. She smiled, and I ordered for both of us. While we were eating snacks and drinking wine, I asked her, how long have you been working at Escort to success? Chris cheered up a little and then replied, for years. Was it a pleasant four years? I asked. She looked surprised by the question, but after a pause, she answered, everything is fine. Not as desirable as the art job I had before, but after all sorts of layoffs, I couldn't find another job in the arts, and I had bills to pay and two small daughters to support. She went on to talk about what kind of work she had in the art world before and that she was a single mother with no man in the girls' lives. Do you earn more at escort to success than at your previous job in the arts? I asked, a little surprised at what she seemed to be implying. She looked puzzled again. Yes, I, ah, uh, earn more, she answered, stuttering. What are your current sources of fundraising for escort to success? I asked. This time she was truly puzzled. After a long pause, she said, I don't think we have a connection, Brett. I'm not sure we're on the same page. She was about to say something else, but then her cell phone buzzed. It didn't ring, but I heard the vibration. She took it out of her small purse, looked at the screen, and said, I have to answer. She made a few comments into her phone, and then her eyes widened at one point. She said, holy crap, then she pressed the mute button on her phone, looked me in the eyes, and said, you didn't order a girl named Tammy today, did you? What are you talking about, Chris? I replied. I realized that this was the first time I had actually called her Chris. My name is Tammy, not Chris, she said, first seriously and then with a grin. Look, Brett. I don't work for charity. I work in an escort service. I was supposed to meet a guy named Brad at your hotel room 1901. What? I replied, now I too was completely puzzled. I'm the only one in 2901, and I didn't ask Tammy. I was scheduled to meet Chris, the development director for the charity escort to success. Tammy picked up the phone again, having said a few words to him. She laughed, 1901. Not 2901. Damn it, my handwriting is terrible. It's late. Then she looked at me, despite the confusion. Do you mind if I stay for dinner? After a pause, I smiled. No problem. I just need to use your phone when you're done since I need to make a call myself. She nodded her head yes, returned to her phone, and said, I'll call you tomorrow, B, and interrupted the conversation, laughing. She handed the phone to me. I laughed to myself. I called my philanthropy coordinator at home. The first two times she didn't answer, perhaps because she didn't recognize the name on the caller ID. But when I called the third time, she said cautiously, Hello, Don, this is Brett. My phone doesn't work, and I'm using a good Samaritan's phone. Have you heard anything from Escort to success? Yes, 
Christopher Thompson called about 20 minutes ago and said that he was late and that you were not in the room when he arrived, Don answered, suppressing my laughter. I replied, please call and tell him that I will be at the escort to success office tomorrow at 11 a.m., not 10, and we will have to skip lunch. Something else has appeared. Call me on this number to confirm, okay? Brett, she replied, clearly embarrassed. I handed the phone back to Tammy. When Dawn calls back, please answer the phone, tell her I'm unwell, and take the message. This will really liven up tomorrow in my office, okay Joker, she laughed. She did as she was asked when her phone buzzed a few minutes later, making sure to answer in her most seductive voice. After she ended the call, we were both laughing so hard that we barely finished our appetizers by the time the main course arrived. Now that everything is cleared up, we had a very fun and interesting conversation. It was truly the first non-work-related extended time I'd spent with a woman since my divorce and the first social situation since my divorce in which I wasn't nervous. As the evening went on, I noticed more and more because I now knew this was not a business, how attractive Tammy was, not her real name, her name was Susan. She was also charming. I was charming too. The circumstances were so unique that the anxiety I had felt earlier that evening disappeared, at least for that night. When we had been in the restaurant for two hours, since I was without a phone and did not know the number of the limousine driver. I went outside and told him to park within sight of the restaurant and wait for us to get out. The two crisp $100 bills I gave him elicited a broad smile and an answer, yes, sir. Susan and I essentially closed the restaurant. The staff wasn't upset given the tip I left. As we were leaving, she grabbed my hand, kissed me on the cheek, and said, it was the best time I've had in a long, long time. There were tears in her eyes. It was also my best time in a long time. Susan, but why the tears? Even though I'm a call girl, you treated me like an equal, like a date you wanted to impress, she sighed. Why would I treat you as anything other than an equal? I'm sure I'm better than you at some things, and you're better than me at others, which makes us equal, I replied. Susan smiled widely, kissed my cheek again, and then said, I would offer you a free service, but the nanny requires me to be back by midnight. As I looked into Susan's captivating eyes, saw the devilish smile on her lips, and then continued my gaze down to her impressive breasts backslash. I confirmed that for the first time since my divorce, I felt she can attract it to someone. This inspired my answer, if the nanny gets another $200, can she stay the night? Susan smiled, took out her phone, and called Cheryl. Something has come up. If I pay you another $200, can you stay the night? Yes, I'm serious, Susan said. Great, call your mom. If you don't call back, I'll assume you can. I'll be home. Then she looked at me, what time tomorrow? Will I be home at 10? I answered. 10, she said. About 7 o'clock tomorrow morning, tell Mrs. Johnson who lives next door to come early so you can get home and get to school. Tell her there's extra money for her too, Susan continued, then looked into my eyes. I raised two fingers, another $200 for her too, she continued, and then after chatting a little more, she broke off the conversation. Let's go, she grinned, putting the phone in her purse. I haven't provided free services for many years, but I can't wait to please you. My rules, I smiled devilishly. I'm taking my time with you, and I intend to do everything possible so that you never forget this night. On the way back to the hotel, we took off in the limousine. The driver was happy with another $100 bill I gave him. When we got to my room, we undressed in the hallway in record time, and I carried her to the four-post bed in the bedroom. The three rounds I had from midnight to eight the next morning left me more serene than any other bed experience I've ever had in my life, including my ex-wife, who I actually once loved. Not only was Susan a goddess when it came to her looks, but she did things to me that I never thought were possible. Despite the fatigue because we slept very little, the next morning we were both cheerful. We ordered breakfast to our room and showered together before it arrived. The wide-eyed waitress was delighted by the $20 in cash I gave her. In the morning light, Susan, wet-haired and without makeup, looked even better than the night before. We laughed and kissed and touched each other between bites of breakfast. As soon as we got dressed to get her to the apartment by 10 a.m., I saw the light. Susan, is there any hope for a real relationship with you? 
I asked seriously. At first, I think Susan thought I was pulling her chain, but as we rode in the limousine to her house, she realized that I was serious. Why would you ask this question to a call girl who is four years older than you and who has six and seven-year-old daughters? I mean, I know I'm great in bed, but be serious, dude, she replied. Listen, I replied, in the 14 hours we were together, I learned more about you than most people do in months, and I really like what I learned. I only care about the future, not the past, and you made me feel more alive than I ever have in my life, even after making billions of dollars in business deals. She looked at me strangely. I have a plan. I haven't thought about it for long, but enough to complete the first part. How much are your expenses per month? Susan was stunned, but not so stunned that she couldn't respond. About $6,500. Okay, how about we take a month's sabbatical? I'll write you a check for $113,000 right now, which is double your expenses during this month. I will meet your children, we will date. You can visit me in Chicago, and we will see if we are right for each other. This can be with or without Intim. $113,000 is not for intimate, but so that you can take a sabbatical without harm. What do you say? You're serious, aren't you? She asked. As serious as a heart attack, I replied. Come on, a month. What do you have to lose? She thought for a few more minutes, took her phone out of her purse, and pressed the speed dial button. Hey, BIA, this is Tammy. Can you ask someone to relieve me this week and not assign me for 31 days? I need to take a sabbatical. I don't care what Simone says, she knows that very well. Okay, just call me back and confirm before noon. Bye. As soon as she ended the call, I took my checkbook out of my jacket pocket. You know, I don't even know your last name, I chuckled, running my pen over it. Susan Collins. She smiled. I wrote out a check and handed it to her. She stared at him as if she wasn't sure he was real. At that moment, we arrived at the address she gave to the driver. I pulled out $400 in cash from my money clip and handed it to her as well. This is for Nanny and Mrs. Johnson, I smiled. She quickly kissed me on the lips and, about to leave the limousine through the door that the driver held open for her, said, be here at 7 p.m. to meet my daughters for dinner. It will be done, I smiled as she turned and entered her apartment, not forgetting to wiggle her amazing fifth place. That morning at escort to success, I had a hard time concentrating. I was daydreaming about the night before. However, I learned enough about the charity to be impressed by what they do. I made a donation of $250,000, leaving everyone present very grateful. Before leaving, I asked one of the employees, who herself had an eight-year-old daughter, what six- and seven-year-old girls would like to receive. She gave me a list of five possible gifts and pointed out the store that most likely had them. I bought a dozen pink roses for Susan and relatively modest gifts for each of her daughters. I didn't want to go overboard. I arrived exactly at 7 p.m. The door was opened by the sweetest girl I've ever seen, in a beautiful dress and a bow in her hair. Hello, are you Miss Mr. Connor? Yes, what's your name? I asked. I'm Misty, I'm seven years old. Do you like my mom? She answered. At this time, Susan came up and laughed. Admit the Fifth Amendment to whatever she asks you about tonight, Brett. Misty will become a prosecutor when she grows up. Susan kissed me on the cheek. She was impressed by the roses. Misty and her less curious little sister Beth were also impressed with their gifts, so they immediately warmed up to me. The four of us were bustling around the kitchen, helping prepare dinner. Although Misty and Beth seemed to be helping more than I was, by the time we sat down to eat around 7.45, I already felt like I had known them for a very long time. The dinner conversation was interesting. Misty asked questions like a prosecutor and made awkward remarks that only a little girl could make. The most embarrassing statement was, You know, Mr. Connor, Mom never invited men to dinner with us. She must really like you. I laughed and said, she admits the fifth. What does it mean? Beth asked. That means I won't comment on it, Susan grinned. The food was truly excellent. After dinner, we all helped clean up. Susan taught her daughters well. 
We talked for another half hour, during which time I looked around and saw how tastefully Susan's apartment was decorated and how selectively she selected the works of artists. After our conversation, Susan sent the girls to get ready for bed. There was no conversation. After putting on their pajamas, they returned to the living room. Beth timidly approached me with a book called Dragon's Love Tacos. Won't you read it to me in my bedroom? She asked timidly. Honey, Brett and I are going to have a grown-up conversation. He's not, Susan said before I interrupted her. I would love to, Beth. I smiled, looking at Susan and saw a wide smile on her face. Will you put me to bed, Mom? Misty asked. Susan went to Misty's room, and I went to Beth's room. The book was absolutely hilarious. Even funnier was the fact that Beth corrected me if I missed a word or explained a picture poorly. Apparently, she had the book memorized. After I kissed her forehead and said goodnight, when I went to turn off the light, she asked, Will we see you again, Mr. Connor? You can count on it, honey, I laughed. Susan returned to the living room with a glass of wine in her hand and a glass poured for me when I returned. Sorry you got overwhelmed, she chuckled. I was flattered. I always wanted kids, but I left my ex before we had them. You two are just lovely, I answered honestly. They are my life, Susan said sincerely. After a few more compliments about the dinner, her taste in decoration, etc., I said, Okay, Susan, are you ready to plan some activities for the future? I can only stay in Seattle tomorrow and the next two days, and then I have to go back to Chicago. What's your schedule for the next two days, with the exception of 90 minutes at the gym every day, which I never miss, and getting the kids ready for school and getting them back? I want to spend time with you to find out if you're really serious about a relationship and how it might work. I'm also wondering why someone as rich as you would be interested in me and what would your family and friends say, she answered in a completely calm voice. Great. I hope you don't mind if I train at the same time, although you'll probably put me to shame. As for what others think, I don't care. In the meantime, we can go wherever we want and take the girls when it's appropriate. But let's make a schedule for the rest of the month, I smiled. We spent the next two hours negotiating, talking, comparing schedules, and exchanging ideas. About every 15 minutes, she would lightly hit me on the shoulder and say, stop staring at my tits, or stop staring at my thighs, depending on the situation. I just grinned and continued to stare every chance I got. By 10.45, we had everything planned. As we said goodbye, Susan gave me a searing kiss and then make a sound, I'd like you to stay the night but I never invite anyone over while my girls are here unless I'm in a serious relationship. I understand, I chuckled. I told you that this month is not about intim, although I would not refuse it, but about the possibility of relationships. See you tomorrow at 10 o'clock in the morning to go to your fitness club and received another passionate kiss before walking out to the waiting limousine. When I arrived at 9.35 the next morning, Susan was already dressed in her workout uniform. Do you have a change of clothes in this suitcase? She asked, pointing to the bag in my hand. Of course, there is, I answered. Free your limousine for the day. I'll take you wherever we need to go, she said. I did as ordered, and we got into her Prius. I see that you drive an environmentally friendly car, I smiled. I need to help save the future for my girls, she smiled back. When we arrived at the fitness club, there was a female administrator and a male owner behind the counter. They greeted Susan warmly, obviously knowing her well. She told the owner, I have a guest today. I've never invited him before, so I don't know if it's paid for or if he's our best client. No, he chuckled. Then he looked at me carefully. Has anyone ever told you that you look like Brett Connor? He asked. I get told this a lot, I laughed, but I believe Brett Connor owns his own gym. The owner laughed too. Susan gave me a playfully indignant look. When we left the counter, she asked, Are you not only rich but also famous? I may be a little famous among environmentally conscious people because my largest company is the first in the world that has no negative impact on the environment. And I was recently written about in the Wall Street Journal and the New Yorker magazine. I smiled. But I thought you told me last night that you got here on a private jet. Is that eco-friendly? She asked. Yes, because for every hour my private jet operates, one of my companies buys an acre of land in the Amazon or Canada and plants it. 
That's how. Susan smiled widely, kissed me quickly on the cheek, and then said, let's get down to business. Over the next 90 minutes, I learned several things. First of all, Susan is a workout fanatic. She had the most intense workouts I've ever seen. Not surprisingly, genetics aside, her body was perfect, not an ounce of excess flesh and lots of sculpted muscles. Her body was similar to Elizabeth Hurley's. Secondly, when she worked up a sweat in her workout clothes, she could make anyone go crazy just by looking at her. Thirdly, I wasn't the only guy who thought she was the epitome of hot. Every man there was either staring at her or trying to talk to her. She politely refused all conversations, saying, Sorry, but I have to finish training and then go to work, and then she simply ignored them. Although I couldn't match her intensity, I was on a roll when we finished. As we started walking to her car, I asked, Are we going to take a shower here? No, we can't have Intim in the shower here, she smiled. We actually had Intamin in the shower at her apartment. For some reason, my fatigue just disappeared when we stepped into her large shower stall together, especially when she leaned over. No wonder it was the best experience of my life. Later that day, we went to get tested for intimate transmitted diseases and visited classic Seattle spots. During a pause in our activities, Susan stopped in the park and said, I have serious information for you. Okay, I smiled. There are two things that I wasn't open with you about during our conversation the evening of our meeting and one that we haven't discussed yet, she sighed, clearly a little nervous. Okay, I replied. And which one's first? First of all, I hate being a call girl. It's not even good, as I said when you asked the question about how I like it. I only do this out of necessity, she replied, looking from me to the floor of her car. No wonder, I replied. What else? I lied and kept silent about the second one. I lost my job in the art industry because I was arrested for stealing two pieces of art from the gallery where I worked. I wasn't the one who stole them, but I got fired, and it cost me all my savings and even went into debt to pay a lawyer to prove my innocence. However, even when the charges were dropped, I was not rehired, and there was a black cloud hanging over my head. So, I was unable to find a job in the field that I loved, and my bills, coupled with not having a job for several months, had left me in such a dire financial situation that I was worried about how to properly care for my girls. I realized that the only way to get out of debt and properly support my girls was to become a call girl. What haven't we discussed? I asked calmly. The girl's father is my ex-husband. He was my ex and died when the girls were two and three, just before I lost my job. He was very bad with money. He left almost nothing to the girls, and he only had a $5,000 life insurance policy. Who gets a $5,000 policy? Either way, they don't remember him and don't have any male influence in their lives, she said. She looked again between my eyes and the floor. When I didn't answer right away, she continued, So, if you want to return your check and withdraw your offer, I will readily agree. I thought for a minute or two, then answered, I really don't want my check returned. I want to continue working as before. If you don't mind, I'll check your background, but unless you turn out to be an axe murderer, I doubt my decision will change. Agreed, I smiled, holding out my hand. Deal, she grinned and then pushed my hand away and kissed me on the lips. Shortly after this, we picked the girls up from school and had a lovely evening. The next day, I ordered an expedited background check. When it arrived a week later, there was nothing in it that would make me change my mind. Her problem with the law was exactly the same as she described, only apparently unknown to her because it was dealt with without fanfare. The identity of the man who stole the art objects she was accused of stealing was established. He fled the country. When I told her about this, she was very happy, although she was angry that none of her former employers told her about it. The next two days and nights, Friday and Saturday, were very interesting in Seattle. I was able to do business for a few hours a day using my new phone, but I spent most of my time with Susan and her adorable daughters. We did all sorts of fun things, mostly for free, but if there were costs, I was willing to cover them. Little Beth seemed very attached to me and insisted on holding my hand when we walked together. All three girls were very sorry to see me leave them on Sunday morning. They came with me to the airport to see me off, the two girls with a heartfelt hug, Susan with a heated kiss. 
which she tried to hide from the girls but apparently failed as they giggled as I left. The next week, I talked Susan into finding a babysitter for the girls and asked her to see me in Chicago. Although I am indeed rich, my home and furnishings, with the exception of my works of art, are modest for a person of my means. Susan seemed impressed by this. She stayed with me from Tuesday to Thursday, and although the intim was not as long, sporty, or energetic as our first night, it was even better. While I was at work, I asked the driver to take Susan to any art site she wanted to see, including the private galleries and collections I had arranged for her. The next week, in a phone conversation, I asked her to take Misty and Beth with her from Wednesday to Sunday. But they have school, and the school they go to doesn't allow unexcused absences. This could be very bad for me and for them, Susan, I answered. Whoever said that money can't buy happiness is 100% right, and I'm a living example of that. However, money can buy almost everything else. Give me the director's name and number, she did so. The absences were excused, and the school staff did their best to give the girls what they were missing so they could take it with them. In return, the school received a new state-of-the-art audiovisual system. The girls really liked the Chicagoland area where I lived. There were a lot of interesting activities, and there were other children around. Even though Susan and I pretended to sleep in separate bedrooms, and even though Intimate was somewhat hampered by the fact that the girls were in the same building, it was still better than any Intimate I'd ever had in my life before. Susan, late Saturday afternoon and night, I took a very bold step, something that Susan was wary of but agreed to. Probably because at that moment she believed that there was at least a 25% chance that we could actually have real relationships. We went to meet my family, including my upper-class parents, my younger brother and his wife, my favorite cousin and her husband, and my brother and cousin's three children. I bought Susan a new outfit that was the right mix of that and formal, as well as new dresses for both girls, which they chose themselves, ignoring both mine and Susan's wishes. Susan was charming, the girls were polite but also very curious, at least Misty was, and overall, the evening went better than I expected. Although all three women at one time or another playfully chided their husbands for paying too much attention to Susan. On Sunday, we went to the pool at my parents' country club. I don't belong to a country club myself because I find it pretentious, but in my weaker moments. I go there, and the girls really wanted to swim in the heated pool. Susan was dressed in a conservative one-piece suit, which I was very grateful for because otherwise she would have given at least a couple of heart attacks to older men. We were having a good time until trouble happened. My ex-wife, Carrie, showed up with her upper-class parents. Carrie is the epitome of new puppy cuteness and cheerfulness, unfortunately, behind the pleasant facade hides a cheating. Both her parents and mine, who move in the same high society circles, were upset when I kicked her to the curb and enforced the marriage contract, which was mutual for infidelity. Although neither of them ever knew the reason, which is why I threw her out, the divorce proceedings were secret. Carrie didn't tell anyone why I was divorcing her, and I didn't see any reason for it either. I simply refused to talk about it with anyone. I simply put off the conversation, saying, Ask Carrie. She left the marriage with only $100,000 of my money. Adding to the stress of the divorce, I had recently heard from friends and even from my own father that Carrie was making noise about wanting to meet and talk to me. I ignored all other people's comments about this possibility. Today, however, I was even more upset to notice that my parents were warmly greeting Carrie. I tried to keep an eye on Carrie so that I could run away if she approached the side of the pool where I was. However, Misty and Beth insisted that I watch them swim and asked me to place objects on the bottom of the shallow water for them to dive for while Susan made circles. After my activities with the kids, they reunited with Mom and went to the diner for lunch. I returned to my son lounger in the shade only to be ambushed by Carrie. Hey, hey, Brett, she exclaimed joyfully, jumping out of her hiding place. What do you need, Carrie? I asked monotonously without facial expression. Don't be like that, Brett. I told you that I'm sorry, she began to say. Oh really? When exactly was this? I snapped. In all the letters that I wrote to you. Of course, since you did not answer my phone calls, my lawyer said that she handed them over to you personally, she sighed. I didn't read them, but I recycled them so as not to pollute the landfill, I replied sarcastically. She didn't understand what I said. 
After another one-sided conversation, Carrie began to speak. You know, you made this a much bigger problem than it really was. As Susan and the girls walked towards me, each girl with an ice cream cone in her hands and Susan with two umbrellas, I interrupted Carrie by saying, Susan, I'm glad you're here. I want you to meet someone who is just leaving. My ex-wife, Carrie. Is this your new girlfriend? Carrie gasped as she got a good look at Susan, who even in a one-piece was the prettiest woman in the pool or anywhere else as far as I knew. No, my bride, I grinned. Carrie burst into tears and left. Susan handed me my drink with an umbrella. She knew I didn't like umbrellas in my drinks and was doing it to tease me, and then sat down next to me. There was stony silence for about a minute, and then she turned to me and said monotonously, I don't remember you asking me to marry you or accepting a marriage proposal, and I don't remember you giving me a ring. Ah, uh, Susan, ah, uh, listen, I stuttered nervously. I needed to get rid of this as quickly as possible, and unfortunately, this was the easy way to do it that came into my head. I'm really sorry. What can I do to make amends? Tell everyone she tells and who asks you that it's not true and a 30-minute back massage tonight. No pranks, understood. Got it, I replied. After a few minutes of silence, when the girls came back to sit next to us, everything returned to normal. I didn't know what to make of Susan's reaction to my fiancé blunder. That evening, I gave her a full 30-minute back massage, not allowing any touching until it was all over. But the session that followed was fantastic. Although I felt overwhelmingly tired, I was really sorry that Susan and the girls left early Monday morning. Early enough that with the time difference between Chicago and Seattle, they could get to school on time. Susan seemed to completely forgive me for the bride comment, given the searing kiss she left me with, while the girls sulked because they were sad to leave. I was scheduled to fly to Seattle on Wednesday evening that same week. I talked to my three girls on the phone Monday and Tuesday evenings and to Susan several times throughout the day, usually shortly before and after her workout. On Wednesday afternoon, I was finishing up some last-minute chores when my secretary called me and said, your father is coming up to your office. It was quite unusual for my father to come to my office since I had complete control over almost every aspect of our companies. And we could usually resolve any issues he raised over the phone. But it was far from unprecedented, therefore, I did not think about it. My father never knocked when he came to my office, there was no need for that. After we hugged, like men, he closed the door and sat down at the table. Son, there is something serious that I need to talk to you about, he said. I've talked to the SMEs. The SMEs are Carrie's parents and your mother, and we really think you should give Carrie another chance. I frowned. I already told you this won't happen. Stop it. Listen, I know that you are fascinated by this hot adult woman, Susan, he began to say. How do you know that she is older than me? I snapped. Because no one could tell that just by looking at her. Well, that's another thing I wanted to talk to you about. I checked her background. She is 38 years old and has been working as a call girl for the last four years, and before that, she was arrested for art theft, he replied with a smug look on his face. It no longer works and is completely justified, I answered calmly, although everything was seething inside me. My father was amazed. Do you know, do you, ah, uh, no, he stuttered. Yes, I knew from the day I met her, and I intend to marry her if she agrees, I answered again as calmly as I could. But, but you can't, he stuttered. What will our friends say? First of all, none of your friends will know about her past unless you tell them. Secondly, if you tell me, and I have to choose between you, Susan, and her past, then if Susan marries me, I will choose her. Thirdly, I don't care what your friends think, I growled. You can't talk to me like that, he grumbled. I just did. Now, if you don't have anything to do, get out of my office and be very, very careful about who you share your information with, I growled. With these words, I stood up, walked to the door, opened it, and waved my hand to him. He left with a red face. I immediately called my mom and told her what had just happened. She pretended that she didn't even know that my father was conducting an audit. But since she was the real boss of the family, there was no way he could do it without consulting her. I ended the call with, I'm serious, mom. If Susan accepts me and I have to choose between her, you, 
and dad, then it will be her. Then I hung up without waiting for an answer. Even though it was difficult, I still did what I needed to do. Before leaving for the airport and on the plane, I was able to calm down and strategize. Susan, Misty, and Beth met me at the private jet terminal at the airport. I was very happy to see them. I invited them to dinner, read Beth's Dragon's Love Tacos too, which she also memorized, and then sat down for drinks with Susan. How was your week? she asked. Everything is the same, I answered. Nothing unusual. Is there nothing you want to talk about? she asked. Nothing I want to talk about, I replied. However, there is something else I want to discuss, something important. Is now the right time? Probably the best time, she joked. Ah, Susan, while it goes without saying that you are the most outwardly beautiful woman I have ever seen in my life. What impressed me more than your looks is your intelligence, strength, and overall inner beauty. I'm so impressed with what a great job you do raising your two little angels and how confident you are despite your setbacks in the art world. I paused and took a deep breath. Looking down at the carpet, into her piercing emerald green eyes, and back down at the carpet before continuing. What I want to say is that I am madly in love with you, and I want to ask you to marry me. But I don't know what your reaction will be, I stuttered. Interesting, she smiled. To continue our conversation, I must tell you about the phone call I received about two hours before your arrival. Your father called me and offered me three million dollars if I would kick you out of my life. Moreover, he told me that a woman like me would never fit into his family and that you would become an outcast if you convinced me to marry you. How does this impact our discussion? She said calmly, then took a sip of wine. Everything was boiling inside me. I had never been so angry in my life, not even when I first found out about Carrie's infidelity. But I calmed myself down. I can understand how $3 million tax-free might appeal to you. It's a way to ensure your daughter's economic future. However, I don't think you are driven by money. I think you earn what you can, however you can, to survive and raise your girls right. But I don't care about this suggestion, I swallowed, and then continued, as for my parents cutting me out of their lives, if they do it, it will be their loss. I never told you that I'm infinitely tougher than the rest of my family put together, except for the romance, which is why at 22. I took over the little company that my grandfather built and that my father broke up. So she became much smaller and made it one of the largest and most profitable companies in the world while at the same time treating employees and the environment fairly, I swallowed again. So I want to say that what my father told you has absolutely nothing to do with what I want our relationship to be. How would my marriage proposal be received? Damn it, she snapped. If you're so cool in other ways, then it's time to become cool in romantic relationships. You'll never know what my answer will be unless you ask. After a long pause, I stood up and said, one second. I went to the kitchen, took a strip of aluminum foil, and folded it into a loop. Then, I walked back into the living room, got down on one knee in front of Susan, held out the aluminum foil hoop, and said, Suzanne Collins, Will you make me the happiest person in the world, accept this symbolic ring, and agree to marry me? She looked at me intently. Do you think it's a good decision to marry a call girl you've only known for less than a month, especially if it means your family will disown you? If you agree to marry me, no one in my presence, including you, will ever use the phrase call girl again. And yes, I think that's a good decision because I'll gain an instant family of three women whom I love, I answered. What if I marry you just because you're good in bed and my girls love you, she asked dispassionately, although there was a sparkle in her eyes. I would take you no matter the reason, I replied. What could I do in Chicago to satisfy my needs besides raising my girls and indulging in carnal pleasures with you? I would buy you an art gallery or get you a job at an art museum or whatever else you want in the art world, I quickly replied. Will there be a marriage contract? Of course with a mutual clause about betrayal, as I had with my ex. I guarantee that the terms will be very favorable to you. And as soon as we are married, I will want to adopt Misty and Beth, if they accept me. Once I adopt them, each will receive a $250,000 education trust fund, with you as the sole trustee. Do you want more kids? I would like one or two more children, but if this is not within my power, I will be very happy with the two wonderful young girls my wife has already given birth to, 
I replied. An evil smile appeared on her face. She stood up, helped me to my feet, took the aluminum foil ring, and holding my hand, led me to her bedroom. Without further ado, she undressed us both. Yes, I will marry you. Now, place this priceless symbol of our commitment on my finger. She held out her left hand, and I placed it on her ring finger, promising to go to the jeweler the next day. I think I had the best night's sleep when I hugged her in the spoon position. The next morning, we were woken up by two excited little girls jumping on us. What are you doing here, Brett? Misty asked. Since last week, I made the girls call me Brett. There's something important I need to talk to you and Beth about this morning, so I wanted to stay the night, I replied. This seemed to satisfy them. Then Susan said to them, go have breakfast. We'll be right back. After they left, I asked Susan, did you really accept my offer? Smiling, she raised her left hand with an aluminum foil loop on her ring finger. As I said last night, with your permission, I would like to ask the girls individually if they would do me the honor of allowing me to adopt them, I said cautiously. Susan's eyes welled up with tears. This is so cute. They would love it. I would love it. If it wasn't a school day, you'd be getting a reward for it right now. Maybe after they leave, I grinned. Maybe, she laughed. It was early enough that I could talk to each of the girls before they left for school. The words and answers were basically the same for both girls. I talked to Misty first because if there was a problem, it would be with her, because Beth had already told me that she wanted me to be her father. Misty, I have news and something I want to ask you, I said. Okay, Brett, she replied. Your mother agreed to marry me and I want your permission to adopt you when we get married so that I can truly be your father and not just your mother's husband. Can I call you dad? If you do this, I wouldn't want anything better, she replied. Okay, I would really like that. I never had a dad, and you'll be a good dad, she giggled. I hugged her and started crying. Why are you crying, dad, she asked. Because I'm so happy, daughter. Susan wanted the girls to finish up the school year in Seattle, and since it was already early May and we had a lot to do to prepare for the wedding, that wasn't a problem. The wedding was supposed to take place in Chicago, so that after it, the children would be in their new home. Sometimes they came to me, and sometimes I went to them. While Susan was very excited, Misty and Beth's excitement levels seemed to be through the roof. Especially when they found out they would be the flower girls at the wedding. I told Susan to hire a wedding planner and do whatever she wanted. What is the budget? She asked. $500,000, I replied. Too much, she replied. No more than $100,000. Give the rest to charity as our wedding gift to the community. I also think we should write no gifts on the invitations and list three charities we want to support with donations instead of gifts. Every day. I loved this woman more and more as each new facet of her personality was revealed. Once the date was set in June, two weeks after Misty and Beth would graduate from school, I emailed, no call or visit, my parents. Susan and I are getting married in June. If you want to attend, let me know 10 days in advance and have Dad apologize to me and Susan for his disgusting phone call to her. If not, then in the future, we will communicate only on business questions. My parents agreed as did Susan's parents. She had been estranged from them ever since she told them she was a call girl, but somehow, when they found out she was marrying a billionaire, they started talking to her again. I may be biased, but I think Susan was the most beautiful bride ever, and Misty and Beth were the cutest flower girls. Honeymooning in Aruba still makes me tense up when I think about it. We wasted no time in having our last two children, our boy was conceived in Aruba, and our girl two years later, probably during a trip to New Zealand. Misty and Beth are two of the most well-adjusted 16 and 17-year-olds I've ever seen and are almost certainly on their way to top-tier universities and will be highly productive members of society. Now, 10 years after Tammy walked into the wrong hotel room, I am the happiest guy in the world. What do you think of our story today? I think it was more of a love story about how chance can change your whole life and sometimes the other way around, which is what I liked about today's story. What's your opinion? Write it in the comments. See you in the next video.